Hi there, and welcome to this guide for the TSA section one. We'll talk a little bit about the structure of the exam, the types of questions, and then go through 10 top tips on how to ace the exam. So first of all, what is the structure of the exam? The TSA has 50 questions in it, and each question is worth one mark. It's not negatively marked, so you won't lose any marks for a wrong answer, you'll just gain a mark for each correct answer. This means it's a really good idea to, to have an attempt at every single question on the exam, even if you're not sure, even if you're guessing, because you won't lose any marks if your guess is wrong, but you'll lose the opportunity to gain a mark if you simply leave that question blank. There are 25 problem solving and 25 critical thinking questions, and we'll get on a bit more to what those mean in a minute. You've got 90 minutes to answer those 50 questions, so this works out at just under two minutes per question. So the timings are quite tight on this exam and speed really is of the essence. Each question is multiple choice and you'll have to choose one of five answers. It'll be automatically marked by a computer and then your raw score out of 50 will be converted into your final score. And this is done using a statistical algorithm that's based on how well the whole cohort has done in that year. This is to account for the fact that the exam might be differently difficult year on year to make it as fair as possible. This means that when you're looking at the score you're aiming for, you shouldn't necessarily be aiming for any particular score as you can't know for sure whether that will convert into a, the score that will get you an interview or not. So therefore the best idea is to aim for the highest score you can get rather than trying to tactically work out what the threshold is for an interview as chances are you aren't going to be able to work that out because it changes every year. In terms of what converted scores are interpreted as though, a converted score of 60 on the scale that ranges from zero to 100 is seen as an average score. Remember however that this is the average for a cohort of people who are applying to Oxford and Cambridge, so it's not necessarily an average of the whole population of students. 70 is seen as a comparatively good score and a score of 80 or above is seen as exceptional. So let's have a look at the question types next. So the first general type of question is problem solving questions and these are testing your numerical reasoning ability. There's three types of problem solving question. The first type is relevant selection. So in these questions, you'll be presented with a lot of information, a lot of data, but not all of it is going to be relevant to you finding the answer. Some of it will simply be irrelevant. Some of it might be distracting and maybe even encourage you to think you need to use it, but you don't. So the skill here is really zeroing in on what's relevant by really specifically reading the question and knowing exactly what that data means before you come to select it. These questions are quite easy to spot. If you see a question with so much information, you think I couldn't possibly do anything with all of that in two minutes, chances are you don't have to, it's a relevant selection question, and the challenge comes from working out which bits of that information are the bits you need to use. Once you've found the correct information, the method to find the answer will genuinely be quite simple. The second type of problem solving question is finding procedures. So in these questions, you're not going to have as much data to select from, but the method to get to the answer is going to be more complicated and it might require several steps and not be immediately obvious to you. Now, remember the TSA is a very tightly timed exam and you do only have just under two minutes per question. So if you are working out an answer and you find yourself spending a lot longer than two minutes on the method, there is probably a quicker and easier way to do it, which is important to remember when you're thinking about a finding procedures question and how to get to the answer. Make sure the solution you're coming up with is something that could feasibly be done in less than five minutes, because that's the timings of the exam. And they're not going to expect you to do something that could not be done in the time. The final type of problem solving question is identifying similarity. So these questions can be quite varied. You might get data presented in several ways, for example, a graph and a table, and have to use these two and compare them to find the answer. Or you might be given a shape and your answers might be a selection of different nets and you've got to identify which could or couldn't be a net for that shape. So there's lots of different kinds of identifying similarity question, but what draws them all together, as the name suggests, is it requires you to compare and find similarities between information that's presented in multiple formats. The other type of question in the TSA is the critical thinking questions, and these test your verbal reasoning ability and your understanding of the structure of arguments and lines of reasoning. 
there are seven types of critical thinking question. The first type is identifying the main conclusion. So as the name suggests, this kind of question is looking for you to find the conclusion to the passage you're given. With these questions, the conclusion will always be in the text you're given as part of the question. So that gives you a pointer as to what you're looking for straight away. The best way to tackle these questions is to read the passage, find what you think is the conclusion, and then compare it to each of your five answer choices and find which one really mirrors that conclusion. The answer to these questions might sometimes be able to trick you. They might give you other things that are in the passage but aren't a conclusion, for example, one of the reasons for the argument. So the key thing here is to make sure you're confident what the conclusion is before moving on to look at the answers. And these questions will normally be phrased, which of the following best expresses the main conclusion of the above argument? The second type of critical thinking question is drawing a conclusion. So you'll need to choose which one of the answers is the most logical conclusion to the argument you've been given. The difference here is that the conclusion will not be in the passage you're given in the question. Instead, you'll have to look at those reasons given in the question and then work out which conclusion follows most logically from what you've been given. So with this, it's not just about what conclusions follow from those reasons in a roundabout way, because chances are several of the answers will. You need to be really specific about it and think about the scope of the argument, how general or specific the reasons are and how general or specific the potential answers are to make sure you're focusing in on the question that is most logic. So when tackling these questions, the best idea is to focus on which conclusion can most logically be drawn from the argument and making sure you're looking at the right level of specificity. So chances are a few of the potential answers would be conclusions that could sort of reasonably be drawn from that argument, but they might be different in certain more nuanced ways. So for example, some of them might be more specific or more general than the reasons in the argument. So therefore you want to make sure the conclusion you're selecting matches as specifically as possible to the line of reasoning given in the question. And these questions will usually be phrased, which one of the following conclusions is best supported by the passage above? The next type of question is identifying an assumption. So assumptions are things that aren't stated in the argument but are taken for granted in order to reach the conclusion given. So the first step is to identify the conclusion in the argument and identify the reasons and then have a think about what idea is sort of missing for that conclusion to make sense and match it to the correct answer from the five that you're given. These questions will usually be phrased, which of the following is an underlying assumption of the argument above? The next type of question is assessing the impact of additional evidence. So in these questions, you'll have to choose which one of the five answers most strengthens or most weakens, depending on the question, the argument above. So these questions will usually be phrased, which of the following, if true, would most weaken the above argument or which of the following, if true, will most strengthen the above argument. The best way to deal with these, if you're not sure, is to take each potential weakening or strengthening statement in turn, apply it to the reasoning in the argument and have a think about what effect that might have on the conclusion you can draw and whether that changes it. The next type of question is detecting reasoning errors. So in these questions, you've got to identify the flaw in the argument. You're going to work out why the conclusion doesn't follow from the reasons given and then match that to one of the answers. These questions are usually phrased, which of the following is the best statement of the flaw in the argument above? The next type of question is matching arguments. So you'll need to pick out which answer choice is structured most closely to the argument given in the passage. Normally the argument in the passage is going to have a different context to all of the answers. So the best way to tackle these kinds of questions is to take the line of reasoning from the passage in the question out of its context. So you could express it in a way like saying if X happens, then Y happens, rather than using the context from the question. And using this bare bones structure allows you to more easily compare it with each of the answers without getting distracted by context and you're more likely to get to the correct answer. These questions will usually be phrased, which of the following most closely parallels the reasoning used in the above argument? And finally, applying principles. So you'll have to work out what principle or general recommendation the argument in the passage rests upon and then match it to one of the answers that uses the same principle. These questions will usually be phrased, which one of the following best illustrates the principle underlying the argument above? So that's it for the format of the TSA, and now we'll move on to our 10 top tips on how to do as well as you can. Tip number one, and I've put it as number one because I think it's the most important and it is to prepare. 
the TSA is not the kind of exam that you can walk into an ACE or you can cram for the night before and expect to do well. This is because it isn't a knowledge exam. It's a skills test, it's an aptitude test, and there's a very specific kind of technique that's required in order to do well on the TSA, partly because it is such a tightly timed exam. This isn't the kind of thing you can develop overnight. You want to be practicing as much as you can, as early as you can, in order to really succeed on this test. There's lots of practice materials out there, so start using them and start using them early. But it's also important to remember, if you are coming into your TSA preparation a little later in the game, some preparation is always better than none, so just do what you can. Tip number two is to brush up on your math skills. So the problem solving questions in the TSA will be based on maths and that maths is normally pitched around a GCSE maths level and on the simpler end of the kind of things you'd be expected to know for GCSE maths. So make sure that you're comfortable with that kind of maths. If you haven't done maths with GCSE, it might be time to recap some of that. Or if you're doing A-level maths, it's still important to make sure your mental math skills are as good as they can be because you don't get a calculator in this exam. Tip number three is to learn the question types. So we've just discussed all the different types of question and a really good idea is to learn these question types and get really good at identifying them within the exam. This is gonna help you realize what kind of reasoning is expected of you to get to the answer and is going to help you avoid certain traps. For example, in the relevant selection questions, some of the irrelevant information might lead you to a wrong answer and that wrong answer might actually be given as one of your options. But if you can identify it's a relevant selection question, you'll be on the lookout for that sort of thing and you'll be less likely to fall for it and more likely to get the right answer. Tip number four is read the question carefully. There's often gonna be nuances in the wording or small pieces of information that are really key to understanding how to find the answer. So make sure you fully understand the question before you come to answer it. You might want to get a basic overview first, so read the question, read the answers, and then come back to it in more detail to make sure you really understand it before you select an answer. Tip number five is to develop a timing strategy and then stick to it. So as I've said many times in this video, this exam is really tight on timing. You've got 1.8 minutes per question, which is not long at all. Now in practice, some questions are going to take less time than that, and some questions might take you slightly longer. What's good to work this out for yourself, because everyone's timings on the questions will be different, is to do practice exams and have a think about what you could do really quickly and what kinds of questions you needed more time on, and then you'll know better what to expect from yourself in the actual exam. It also might be a good idea to set some time limits on yourself, so saying by 10 minutes into the exam I want to have this many questions done, or something like that. Timing it question by question is obviously hard because all of the questions aren't going to take the same amount of time, but setting these limits and sticking to them is really important to make sure you get through all of the questions in the exam. And make sure you put an answer down for everything. If you're going to leave something and come back to it, you may not have time at the end. So before you leave it, write down a guess, just in case, so you don't get to the end of the exam and end up without an answer for one of the questions. Tip number six is to use the process of elimination. So sometimes you might be really struggling with a question and really struggling on how to find the answer. And that's okay because there are other tactics you can use to increase your chances of being correct, even if you can't quite find that answer. So it's a good idea to use the process of elimination and think about which answers immediately stand out to you as wrong or you can see are wrong with very little working out and eliminate those. Then even if you run out of time and have to guess, you've increased your chances of getting the right answer by eliminating some of the wrong ones straight away. Tip number seven is move on as soon as you have answered a question. The timing is so tight on this exam that you just haven't got time to be really methodically checking everything before you move on to your next question. If you do that, you might end up running out of time before you've answered the questions at the end, which is what we really don't want. If you do have time left over at the end, that's the time to go back and check things. But during the exam, the best strategy is simply finish a question, get to your answer, move on. Tip number eight is use the resources that are available to you in the exam. You are allowed to make scrap notes on the question paper itself. So make sure you use that. Making Scribbling down some notes, for example, writing down your working out, 
sketching out some spatial questions if you struggle with those is going to help you organize your thinking and potentially avoid mental maths mistakes. So if you're doing something that's a bit more complicated, you're allowed to write stuff down and I think it's really important for you to use that ability. Writing down working out for some of the more complex questions will also help you if you have time to check as you'll be able to review your method and potentially if you've made a mistake, it might stand out to you then. Tip number nine is to use everything you can find to prepare. So online there's plenty of TSA past papers for you to use and if you run out of those you can also use BMAT section one past papers as the format of the questions is exactly the same. You can also apply your developing critical thinking skills in everyday life. So for example you can consider the logical structure of arguments that you see within a newspaper and that helps you develop that skill that way. Tip number 10 is to read through the explained answers on the specimen paper. This is an excellent way to get an idea of what the question setters are expecting you to do as they've explained the reasoning behind the answer to every question on the specimen paper. A really great way to start your revision is to do the specimen paper, mark it and then have a look at the explained answers to see the reasoning you needed to do both for the questions you got right and those you got wrong. Then you can take that knowledge and apply it in your future past papers and in the exam itself so you know exactly what kind of reasoning you need to be doing in order to get the right answers. So that's our video on the TSA section one and hopefully you now feel well equipped to succeed in the exam. Thank you for watching.